Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Carson City Board of Supervisors. Today is Thursday, September 17th. We are in the community room at 851 East Williams Street. Can we have a roll call, please, tomorrow? Good morning, Supervisor Gio. Aubrey, sorry. Here. Supervisor Bagwell. Here. Supervisor Barrett. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Bonkowski. Here. Thank you. Jason. For the record, uh, Carson City District Attorney Jason Woodbury. With Mayor Kroll's uh, passing, I wanted to offer the board a statement outlining the legal procedures that are triggered by the vacancy in the office of Carson City Mayor. Section 3.015 of the Carson City Ch Charter provides that the mayor pro tempore, uh, quote, shall act as mayor until the next next general election if the office of mayor becomes vacant, end quote. Uh, Supervisor Bonkowski was elected as mayor pro tempore in January of this year, and he will serve as acting mayor through January 3rd of uh, 2021. On January 4th of 2021, Supervisor Bagwell will assume the office of mayor by virtue of her election to that office earlier this year. Uh, one of the duties of Acting Mayor Bonkowski will be to preside over the meetings of this board. Uh, and during this period, the membership of the total membership of the board is reduced to four. Uh, this means that uh, three members are still needed to be a quorum of the board uh, to conduct business and take action. Any motion that results in a vote of two in favor and two against is a failed motion uh, because it is not approved by a majority of the board. Um, so that is an outline of uh, some of the procedures that will be applicable these next few meetings. Thank you, Jason. Are there any questions from members of the board? All right, thank you very much. At this time, uh, if we could all stand. <clears throat> I'd like to have a moment of silence uh, for uh, Mayor Kroll, and then after the moment of silence, uh, we'll move to the invocation. Janet told me she'd have plenty of Kleenex out here today, but I don't see any. Just to pray. Father, you know our world, and you know what's going on right now. And we hear about grace and mercy and love and peace. And we're, yet we're seeing a lot that seems in opposition to that. We would ask your blessings upon all the crises going on around us, around the world. And through them all, may we see your love and your grace and your mercy and peace. And now, Father, here we are without that center stage smile that greets us all. Whenever I came into the room, Bob would run and greet me with a smile and ask how my grandkids were. This morning, as I was reading morning devotional, I saw him all through the page as I read these words of Bob Goff. God didn't settle for second best when he created you. You're not a carbon copy. You're an original. Play your own song. Write your own book in your voice. Make your own painting, not someone else's. 
Keep your eyes on Jesus and let him fill your imagination with your own unique gifts to bring to the world. What do you have that you can give to others in love? And that was Bob, an original, with unique gifts bringing to the world in love. Chaplain Craig called him a gift to everyone. We pray that we can remember those good qualities, Lord, and to put to rest those differences and difficulties that we may have had. We pray for peace and comfort for the family. We pray that the good memories live strong. And I conclude with the high priest Aaron's blessing upon Israel. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May our community be blessed with fair winds and following seas. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. Jason, could you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we will take public comment. Before we start with public comment, uh, I wanted to thank Stacy, Supervisor Giomi, for picking up the, the remembrance uh, bouquet for Bob. I wanted to thank Sheriff Furlong and Chief Slayman and everybody on staff for putting together the motorcade to bring Bob's body back and, and to set up the, the honor guard uh, ceremony that we had on, uh, on Saturday. Um, and then I, I wanted to uh, start public comment um, with a message to Bob's family. To Susan, Bob's four children and grandchildren, and grandchildren, you have our deepest appreciation for sharing your husband, father, and grandfather with us these many years. You have our most sincere condolences on your loss. It is a sad day as well for the city and for the state with the loss of Bob's leadership and guidance. You are hearing today and will continue to hear over the coming days how Bob was the one, the one that could bring people together to get to the right answer, to show us the honorable way to lead and advocate for those who needed it most, to always give the credit to others, to be a leader while still being part of a team, to be humble and not covet the spotlight while we all knew who the driving force was. Bob was the epitome of who we should all strive to be. Thank you, Bob, and rest in peace. At this time, um, we will open it up to public comment. We've also received uh, written public comment, and the written public comment will be incorporated as part of the permanent record for this agenda. Desi, do we have anybody on the line for public comment? We have one caller. Caller, when you hear the beeps, it's your turn for public comment. Please state your name for the record. Good morning, board and staff. For the record, Maurice White. I have called in today to offer my opinion regarding action item 20A. I see that a number of capital improvement projects and new supplemental requests are included in this revision to the Carson City Capital Improvement Program budget. While I do agree with staff that our capital improvement program must be made whole, I offer a word of caution regarding your action today. While the Carson City budget is in fact in good shape and can support these revisions, I suggest we do not fully understand what the governor's 
$1.2 billion black hole deficit will bring from the upcoming legislature. It is my concern that the deficit predicted to be in the state's budget will bring unfunded mandates to the various counties and cities. I ask today that if you approve these revisions, you do so with a restriction that the monies not be spent until at least the governor's new budget is released to the public and it is favorable to our city's budget and will allow the actual spending of the money in question today. Thank you, board and staff, for your time and attention in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Waite. Dizzy, is there anybody else on the line for public comment? There's no, no more public comment. Is there any member of the board that wanted? Um, Dan Stuckey. Good morning, board. Dan Stuckey, Deputy Public Works Director, for the record. I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to introduce some new employees that we have. Obviously, I wish the mayor was here um, to meet them as well. Um, first, I want to introduce our new city engineer, uh, Randall Rice. Randy comes um, with broad experience both in the public sector and the private sector, designing, managing large infrastructure projects. He has experience in land development, so um, he kind of brings that diverse skill set that we expect out of our city engineer. So we're um, excited to have him. He's also a past president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, so very involved in the community. Um, we're excited to have him on board. So I wanted to bring introduce him. To the left, far left there is Robert Nellis. He's our new real property manager. Um, he comes uh, again with another diverse skill set, both in law, real estate, uh, management of projects, both public and private sector, most recently with the Nevada Department of Transportation. He's also worked um, for Nevada State Land. So those are big partners for the city. He knows how they work. Um, we're excited to have him on board as well. And he's got a big backlog already of a, of a lot of projects. So. Um, but anyway, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce these two uh, gentlemen to you, and obviously you'll be seeing a lot of them in the future. Thank you. Robert, do you go by Robert or by Bob? Uh, good morning, for the record, Robert Nellis. Uh, good morning, board members. Uh, I typically go by Robert because I'm the third, my third generation. We have too many Bobs and Roberts in our family, so <laughs> I chose Robert. Well, great. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Randy, welcome aboard. We have plenty of work for both of you. As I've already found out, yes. So, <laughs> thank you for having me. And I just want to say that um, you're all tasked with a very important and difficult job, and you are crafting the future and vision of Carson City. And so I really I feel privileged to be an instrument of that uh, execution of that vision. So thank you. Thank you both. Welcome aboard. Last call for public comment. Anybody on the line, Desi? There is no public comment. Thank you very much. With that, we'll conclude public comment. We'll move to agenda item six for possible action, approval of the minutes. All the members of the board had a chance to read and review the minutes. I did, I have a correction. If so, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the minutes of August 20, 2020 with two corrections, one on page 13, fourth sentence down, removing the word not, and on page 17 at the 327 52nd mark, uh, removing the word read. So it says, Mayor Pro Tam Bonkowski introduced. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The motion passes 4 to 0. We'll move on to uh, agenda item 7, adoption of the agenda. Are there any items to be pulled, Nancy? Uh, no items to be pulled. Any agenda items to be pulled by any member of the board? All right. Then uh, the agenda will stand and be adopted as published. Moving on to the consent agenda, I've had a request to pull item 11A. Are there any other requests to pull any items from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda um, with the exception of item 11A. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The vote is 4-0 to approve. At this time, we will uh, hear item 11A then, purchasing and contracts for possible action. Discussion and possible action regarding the purchase of asset management on-premises software licensing and integration services with Lumen Inc. for a one-time lump sum total amount not to exceed $104,500 plus an annual amount of $29,088 beginning on August 1st, 2021 for support fees with automatic renewal in each subsequent year and authorization for the Chief Information Officer to sign the agreement. Good morning. James Carroll, take it away. Uh, correct. This is just uh, for a new contract. Um, this is <clears throat> to further the Carson City's asset management program. Um, so the team's <clears throat> been working with that, getting that together. Um, there has been some proposed change language that Lumen has also agreed to. So uh, James and Matt can go over the specifics. James? Yes, uh, James Underwood. Chief Information Officer, for the record. So uh, we did add uh, a bit of language to the contract as it was published uh, to the agenda initially. And this was to pro uh, provide some additional protections for the city in case uh, certain modifications uh, were not made correctly to the software and it doesn't work as, as uh, intended. So the first um, modification is to paragraph five. <clears throat> so paragraph five, um, or section five under payment, uh, the second paragraph as published states, Lumen will start invoicing annual support fees on August 1st, 2021. We are um, replacing that sentence in its entirety with the following sentence. Lumen will start invoicing annual support fees on August 1st, 2021, or on the date by which the software is fully installed and in conformance with the warranties guaranteed by paragraph 10 of this agreement, whichever date is later. Uh, the vendor has agreed to that change. The second uh, change that we've, we've uh, added is in section 10. So currently under warranty, uh, Section 10 warranty, the uh, second paragraph ends in the words services agreed agreement by both parties. After that, we've added the following. Upon the execution of any such agreement of fees and a services agreement for enhancements, the warranties provided by this agreement for the specifications Autom automatically apply to those enhancements. This is so that uh, anything that's customized for us is also covered under warranty. Thank you, James. Any questions from any of the supervisors? No? All right. Then I'll accept a motion. Uh, I move to approve the contract uh, with the changes read into the record and further authorize the uh, CIO to sign the agreement. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Vote is 4-0 vote is to approve. We will now move to uh, the regular action agenda, item 13, 13A for possible action. Discussion and possible action regarding the Carson City Treasurer's proposed city policy for the investment of surplus money and a presentation on the performance of Carson City's investment portfolio. Gail? Good morning. Uh, Gail Robertson, Treasurer for the Record. I have with me today also Rick Phillips. He is the President and Chief Investment Officer of H FHN Financial Main Street Advisors. He advises a uh, a little more than one half of our core investments, and he also is the manager of the um, state LGIP, the local and local government investment pool. So, per our charter, I'm required to bring the uh, investment policy to you each year for review and hopefully adoption. 
So that's what you have before you. We haven't changed it since September of 2019. Great. Rick, how are we doing? Doing well in interesting times. So mm -hmm. I'll get started on the presentation. Just a, a little bit of background. We've been honored to be the uh, one of the city's investment advisors back to when Treasurer Kramer was around in 2005. And uh, we provide investment management and consulting to states and local governments. That's exclusively our business, about $70 billion in assets, a lot of the entities in our state. Uh, we're based in Las Vegas. Our parent company is First Horizon National, uh, founded, I, I was looking at the SIL, just about when the city was founded back in 1864, one of the largest 50 banks in the country. I started my career in the public sector as the investment officer for the city of Las Vegas in 1989 and then moved over to Clark County a few years later. And then about 15 years ago, we, we started our own firm to, to do this for state and local governments. So we're going to talk about the economy and the markets for a few minutes. And then at the end, I'll, I'll talk on the, the portfolio. And so forecasting the markets and the economy, I, I've always loved this, uh, this little cartoon there. It's uh, pretty much a, a coin toss. And a couple quotes uh, from John Kenneth Gilbray, economist in the 70s, he said, the only function of economic, and I added interest rate forecasting, is to make astrology look respectable. Uh, and Chairman Bernanke of the Fed said, the Federal Reserve is currently not forecasting a recession. That was in January of 2008. The Great Recession started the prior month. Yeah. And then, I don't think any truer words have said by a Fed chair uh, last year, Chairman Greenspan said, our ability to forecast is limited. <laughs> so we'll talk about the economy, but you know, who knows where it goes, and especially with uh, all the COVID stuff going on. So a few discussion themes. The economy seems to be shifting to a lower gear. We're, this quarter, we're just finishing these last 15 days or so, kind of rebounding in fifth gear and, and gearing down to maybe a second gear. Employment gains face a tougher road ahead. Flu season's coming. COVID's been such an impact on the economy, of course, where we see a second wave or ripple. And with all that the Fed's done in their money printing and stimulating the economy with this $3 trillion, are we going to see lowflation or highflation ahead? And the Fed introduced a new strategy to let inflation run a little hotter, a little higher, before they raise interest rates in the future. And with that, that's not a great strategy for the city's investments. And for those of us that invest short-term money, it's great if the city needs to refinance anything, if you're refinancing your mortgage, but challenging for the investment portfolio with low interest rates for longer. And then not to get political, but I'll just touch a little bit on some forecasted things with the uh, Trump win on November 3rd, but maybe some post-election day chaos with the, the write-in ballots. So you see that, that little black graph there, that's the GDP is circled in yellow. We had a minus 30, almost 32% annualized the first quarter or the second quarter of the year when everything was, so many things were shut down. And then a big rebound is forecasted this quarter of almost 25%. But then you see slowing down where that is a red a box around there, five, four down. And then I also circled inflation. We will probably see a little higher inflation down the road, but it'll still be low. And so most likely interest rates will remain low in impacting the portfolio. So when I talk about the activity shifting to a lower gear, the New York Fed has this weekly economic index. And you see it's really correlated to the year-over-year -year GDP of the United States. So during the Great Recession 10 years ago, we declined almost 4%. And you can just see the huge drop that we had, of course, the first part of, of this year. And then a big rebound. But it is kind of slowing down because that stimulus, unemployment benefits, they have uh, slowed. And so hope for a second stimulus, a CARES Act kind of challenge right now. We'll see what happens there. This is a look at around the world, many of the developed countries in Europe and Japan and the United States, at their consumer activity, different metrics they use. And you see, of course, the huge drop we had with so many economies around the world shutting down in March and April, and then rebounding pretty sharply in May and June, but then just kind of slowing down here lately. And the US has actually been on the, the lower end, only recovering about two thirds of that where we were before. Gasoline demand, so that, of course, during that, those first few weeks of shutdown, people didn't drive as much. That has rebounded quite a bit. We're only down about 12% of 
pre-COVID times. One benefit on the right-hand side, I've graphed gasoline prices, and, and they, I know it's kind of hard to read. So those were, that peak back in 2008 was around $4 a gallon nationwide, and it's around uh, 2 point, uh, 220 right now. So helpful for consumer to have lower energy prices. So we are driving more, but here's the challenge. Airline travel, I flew up from Las Vegas last night, and flight was fairly full. You have the middle seat not taken on Southwest, um, but we used to have about nine flights back and forth, and I saw there were only three yesterday from Las Vegas to Reno. So this is looking at the TSA checkpoint daily travelers, and you see that we you know, went down 90%, of course, and then we've recovered, but we're only about 36% of the past. So CNBC had an article the other day that domestic airlines, they expect three to five years to recover, and international five to seven years. So it's a big challenge in the airline industry, of course. Those spikes, this is a daily chart, so those spikes are business travelers during the week, and then that kind of bigger spike, that was Labor Day a few weeks ago, but still a big challenge here. Here's retail sales uh, nationwide in billions on the left-hand side. So the bottom graph starts around um, 320 billion. And you see during the Great Recession, it took three and a half years for retail sales to get back. Well, it took three months this time because last time we didn't have $3 trillion get put out into the economy so quickly. The Federal Reserve and Congress, I think, really saw what happened during the Great Recession and just acted so much quicker this time. But employment, this faces a tougher road. This is total employment, so in millions on the left-hand side, 130 million starts the graph. We see the dot-com 9-11 recession. It took 49 months to recover all those jobs. Great recession, 77 months. We dropped 22 million jobs from the economy when things shut down. Our state was hit the hardest. Uh, we've rebounded about 10 million jobs, but still, it just seems like a, a lot of things to go to get jobs back there. A lot of companies filing bankruptcies and laying off people. And the Fed's really watching that because consumers, we make up about 70% of the economy. And when benefits run out, we obviously need jobs to have income to spend. A couple of COVID slides. So that top left is daily cases in the US. And we see it's uh, gone down from 70,000 down to under about 35,000, so that's great to see. Uh, hospitalizations had kind of two waves there, but that's trending lower. Deaths, of course, we'd love to see that at zero, but uh, much, much lower than those really terrible times back in, in April, uh, New York and New Jersey particularly. And one thing we really watch is hospitalizations as a percent of cases. It's dra dropped dramatically. We're really knowing much better how to treat this thing, uh, but Dr. Fauci, he says that we probably won't get back to normal, whatever normal means, till later next year. Here's list the cases looking in our state. Again, we similar pattern as the US. We dropped quite a bit, so that's great to see. Hopefully, more and more things will be able to open up in Nevada. So talk a few slides about inflation. That really drives where interest rates go. So this is the amount that each of the central banks, these big central banks, Bank of Japan, Australia, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve, have increased their balance sheet. So they digitally print money, go out in the market and buy bonds to push interest rates down to help stimulate lower interest rates, you know, mortgages, auto loans, things like that. So you see they've dramatically increased their balance sheets. So Japan, just off the charts, 131%, just but yet their economy, they don't have much inflation, they haven't had much growth. And so the Federal Reserve is really watching that to be careful, not to increase too much, but they've helped to fund that $3 trillion by buying a lot of those bonds issued by the Treasury to keep interest rates low. I'm gonna read a few just of these red remarks here. This is the Vice Chair, Richard Clarida, talking about this new inflation strategy. Again, not good for the city's investments because they wanna keep interest rates low for a longer period of time but great if you're borrowing money. So he said, instead of having a top limit of 2% on inflation, they're gonna have an average target. So inflation could run a little hotter. And then he said, we believe that forward guidance and large scale asset purchases, so we're gonna talk about forward interest rates and then we're gonna to continue to support the market by buying bonds, 
will be effective uh, sources to support the economy when the federal funds rate is at the ELB, effective lower bound, basically zero is what they mean. And he said, and we we're really glad to see this, we do not see negative policy rates or negative Fed funds rate as an attractive policy option in the US. They've seen how devastating that's been to Europe and Japan's economy with the slower growth, and so they don't want to do that. But I kind of chuckled at this line, this next line, going back to my first uh, uh, comic slide there. Our general view is that with credible forward guidance from the Fed, and I put LOL, I don't know when the Feds have very good credible forward guidance. They, they're really bad at predicting the own rate, their own rate that they set. And then lastly, he talks about yield caps and targets were, aren't warranted in the current environment, but should be an option, meaning that they might cap interest rates by buying bonds to keep them low. So we'll see. It's a very new, different realm for the Fed with their, their mandate on inflation. Here's just a long-term look at inflation. The graph goes back to the early 60s. And we see in the 1970s and 80s, we had a spike of inflation getting up to 10% on the consumer price index there. But the last 40-ish years, we've had in inflation decline and really remain very low the last 10 years. In fact, that 2% target, the line I drew, the Fed would like to see inflation a little higher. And you wonder, why do you want to inflate things to cause people to pay more in the future? Well, they've seen devastating impacts of what deflation can do to economies. They don't want that. So they just want a little bit of inflation. But for the last decade, the last 10 years, they've only had inflation above their target of 2% 10 months. So it's, uh, we'll see. It's, well, the demographics are very different back in the 70s and 80s when baby boomers were those forming households and really spending a lot of money to drive prices up. Here's a very long-term look at interest rates. This goes back to 1790. And so average 10-year interest rates in the US from almost when our country started, they've really been averaging about 4 to 6%. So you see in World War II, that uh, low dip there, that was very low. And of course, the spike, that was really unusual. So you know, maybe we'll see another time with interest rates high, but probably not. So, but our super low rates we had during the Great Recession, and then again, all-time low rates that we have right now. I'll just skip that one. Here's, um, here's these negative treasury rates around the world. So you see in the red, Switzerland, Germany, Japan, you know, very low rates. We actually used to be what I call the, the cleanest shirt and the interest rate dirty laundry until the Fed had to lower interest rates to zero earlier this year. But we still have green. We still have positive rates. But that gravitational pull of negative rates around the world is probably going to keep our interest rates low for a long time. Here's the stock market. It relates to the bond markets. So we touch on that. Of course, the, the city's portfolio can invest in stocks. But you just look at the rebound with that huge stimulus that was put out there. And the NASDAQ stocks have really gone well. This is over just the last year. Put a little star there, up 44% uh, on a year-to-date basis. And just to put in context, hopefully you can see this a little bit here. So these are three other bear markets we had. The blue one, that was the dot-com 9-11 recession. It went down 50%, but you just see it was kind of a, a long drive down, 928 days from the peak down to its low. The green line, that's the Great Recession we just had. It was down 56%. took 517 days to get to its low. And then that gray line, that's the Great Depression back in the 1920s and 30s. It had a sharp decline, but then rebounded, but it, it went down an incredible 86%. Can you imagine stocks going down 86%? I just That would have been a challenging time, of course. But just to highlight our current, the bear market we had was the fastest and then the fastest recovery ever. Again, because we'd never had that kind of stimulus in the economy. Just looking at a couple charts on our state, we created a Nevada Economic Index that's comprised of taxable sales that the city receives money from the state each month, gaming revenues, and the state's unemployment rate. We dropped on our index from 140 down to 90, so you know about a 50% decline back during the Great Recession when our state was so hard hit. And then the blue line, that's a looking at a six-month moving average. So you see just our monthly index dropped so far uh, from 180 down to 50 with the economy basically being shut down here. We're starting to see some rebound. Let me show you gaming revenue for the state. Essentially dropped 
down to 99% uh, below what it was, and then has started to rebound in June. There's a delay on the data that we get from the state. And so uh, hopefully that will, as casinos and other operations open up, our main industry will start to have, uh, continue to have higher revenue. Here's Carson City on taxable sales, one of the big revenues for the city. We see just, the, we did the last three fiscal years increasing every year. And in fact, the fiscal year 20, which ended in June, up 5.2% as compared to the state, which was down 1.9%. So the city's doing better than the state overall. Here, in similar vein on unemployment, here's Carson City's unemployment going back to the 90s. Uh, the peak was 21% here recently and dropped dramatically down to 8%. As this is July data, our most current data we have. And the state peaked at 30% and then is currently at 14%. So again, the city's doing much better than, than the state in that regard. Uh, just an interesting thing from the market volatility, a uh, article from the Axios Group saying that Trump could have a, an election day landslide but maybe post-election day chaos due to mail-in ballots because they, they expect more Republicans to vote in person versus Democrats on mail-in. So we watch that just from a market standpoint, from volatility. Um, and then this is, um, you can actually, we shouldn't be surprised living in Nevada, that you can bet on the elections, uh, predictit.org. So... Yet it's a company based out of New Zealand, but they have U.S. operations, and, and they have a lot of people do this. So I like to look at this versus polls, because this is real money. So the top graph is the D Democrats to win. So how it works is you would, right now, you'd bet about $60 for Biden to win, and you'd receive 100 if he wins. And for Trump, you'd bet about $42 and get 100 And so, um, and then down below is the Senate race. Who, can, who will control the Senate? So we see that flip-flopped in May, and, and then it got really tight a few weeks ago, but the Democrats, so that's a, a tight race to just watch who will control the, the U.S. Senate. Um, so interesting thing coming up on November 3rd, but Mike can continue in going back to Bush Gore, where it took, you know, the hanging chads, we'll see. Uh, I, I don't look forward to that. But just from a market perspective, we have plenty of liquidity in the portfolio just in case things get a little crazy. And now looking at the portfolio, this is the total portfolio. Yeah, it's on the right-hand side, it, it's about 92 and a half million at the end of June. Uh, as Gail mentioned, we manage about 40 million. Another investment advisor, GPA, does about 43.8. And then at, the, at June 30th, the state's LGIP balance was 8.4. That average is usually a little higher, but there was payments that, that they were getting ready to make. So just looking at the pie chart, we buy a lot of federal agencies issued by Federal Home Loan Bank, for example, uh, very secure, and treasuries and high-quality corporate bonds. You see the maturity distribution in the top middle, about 42% matures zero to one year just to provide that liquidity. But we also invest out the yield curve to uh, earn higher rates over time. And the bottom left, I put a little red box around there because interest rates have come down and bond rates, bond prices go up, so that teeter-totter inverse relationship. Right now, there's an unrealized gain <clears throat> on the portfolio, about 2.5 million at the end of June. The bottom middle interest rate on the portfolio has dropped just because market rates have dropped so much. Uh, and so again, that unfortunate from an investment perspective. And then just one last graph on the performance this last fiscal year. Our portfolio earned on a total return basis about a 5.29% uh, compared to GPA 3.88 and the state's LGIP, which is a shorter term. We, as Gail mentioned, we run that portfolio. It's a liquidity portfolio. So when interest rates drop, it drops faster. And so, but that's okay, it's for liquidity. And so that only earned a 2.4%. So see our balanced average about 30 and a half million. We had a return a little over 2 million. GPA 40 million, about a one and a half million and then LGIP about a half million. So we, we run a little different strategy in GPA. That's the, the differential on the returns. And with that, any questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Rick. Do you have any questions? Stacy? Yeah, I don't uh, have a specific question. I, we just, this wasn't in our packet, so could we get this right. sent to us? That would be wonderful, Nancy or whomever. The PowerPoint tomorrow. presentation. Thank you. 
John. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And thank you for the presentation. It's one of the most thorough I've seen and takes into account a great deal. Uh, my only concern when we talk about the uh, interest rate situation and the economy is uh, retaining the United States as the reserve currency of the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, makes up the bulk of the transactions. Other countries would like the euro or other currencies to be that reserve currency. Um, if if a, a, a central bank prints a lot of money, that can devalue your currency and you could lose that status. But it, it, it's just it's hard to see for the foreseeable future the U.S. losing that status just because we are a big importer nation. Uh, back to Bretton Woods and the gold standard, we were put, the, the reserve currency of the world was put into the U.S. dollars. I don't see it changing anytime soon. There is talk of a digital currency that could be built by Silicon Valley and, and had by the Fed and the central banks around the world that could change that. Wouldn't be a Bitcoin or something like that. Uh, it's hard to see the euro or the Chinese currency to take that status. Uh, unless we just really change things differently than the rest of the world, which we hadn't, because all, like I showed you earlier, all the major central banks around the world are printing even more money than we are. So it's a concern of mine, supervisor as well. Any other, Thank you. Any other questions? Lori? No? Okay. All right. Would somebody like to make a motion? I move to adopt the policy as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any final discussion? Just as a comment, I did have um, Gail add um, dates that the board has reviewed it so that our charter, everyone would know we were in compliance with the charter. So she'll add today's, today's date. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Any opposed say nay. The vote is 4-0 to approve. Thank you very much. All right, we're on agenda item 14A for possible action. Discussion of possible action regarding a request to reclassify the prevention program coordinator position, CCEAT42, and to move that position from its existing inclusion in the Carson City Employees Association to the Carson City Deputy Sheriff's Association. Mr. Sheriff. Take it away. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Sheriff Furlong, and alongside me, uh, Sergeant Matt Smith, um, who oversees our juvenile activities, school resource officer programs, et cetera. Um, to begin with, just for our audience, this is a discussion and possible action regarding a request to reclassify the uh, prevention program coordinator position, which is a CCEA, um, Carson City Employees Association T42, and to move that that position uh, from its existing inclusion in CCEA to the Carson City Deputy Sheriff's Association. Um, as I said, the purpose of this agenda item is to request your approval to reclassify this position or move this position, a funded position of the Sheriff's Office, from Prevention uh, Programs Coordinator to Deputy Sheriff. Um, at the longstanding direction of this board, as well as your predecessors, as vacancies occur in our organizations, it is incumbent on the directors to perform a review of the positions with IFC before filling vacancies. This position became vacant in late uh, fiscal year 20 on June 4th as a result of the retirement of uh, Deputy Lisa Davis. I must say that the COVID uh, coronavirus uh, crisis did play into her retirement decision, but that was not the sole purpose or sole reason that she retired. The Sheriff's Office mission statement is to provide uh, professional public safety services, and to build mutual trust within our community. Possibly forward thinking, this 18-year-old mission statement addresses much of the strife that we are experiencing nationwide today, trust and confidence in law enforcement. 
Parallel to this, even the Commission on Law Enforcement notes that, thir that of the 13 conditions that affect crime in the community, those relationships between the police and the public, as well as the concentration and the population of youth, are major contributing factors. Programmed within, this, <clears throat> within the strategic plan of the Sheriff's Office, this position, tasks and responsibilities, was created as having a critical impact on our mission, the health, welfare, and safety of the community. Historically, this position was originally put in place in approximately 2003 to address the uh, DARE opportunities in our schools and in the community. Initially staffed by a civilian employee, certification challenges were met since she, at the time, was not sworn. And as the position has evolved from its early years, many of the agency's outreach tasks and priorities were eventually assigned to the position. Within two years, that position was vacated and the civilian employee was replaced with Deputy Lisa Davis, who we all know, a Nevada Post certified peace officer. Throughout Ms. Lisa's tenure, she maintained her law enforcement certification, even though the position itself remained in CCEA. Certainly, having a law enforcement officer within CCEA category of employees is an identifiable conflict. For the past 15 years, consistent with the job uh, description as posted by Human Resources, examples of her uh, job or of, of the job uh, position include DARE, DARE Plus, DARE Keeping It Real programs, developing and coordinating partnerships with schools, parents, teachers, and students, implementing and delivering substance abuse, crime prevention, and violence prevention programs, acting as a community liaison officer for third-party participants, including youth, parents, schools, and law enforcement agencies, organizing and facilitating and coordinating community-based and after-school safety programs, parent organizations, community agencies, civic organizations, and uh, citizen training opportunities, process training requests, maintaining records, schedules, and servicing uh, service training, and assisting with travel uh, to accommodate. She com this position composes and manages grant funds in support of DARE, Cops and Kids, Cops and Kids um, uh, street fairs, National Night Out, Halloween activities, Nevada Day activities, Sheriff's Open House, Dinner with a Cop, Boys and Girls Club events, and many, many other opportunities. This position supervises, supervises and coordinates volunteer staff activities, responds to and assists with student intervention requests regarding juvenile incidents, and demonstrates and instructs on cooperative behavior interactions with the public. These task assignments and responsibilities are not anticipated to change. In compliance with the Board of Supervisors directions for evaluating positions before refilling, the department acknowledges key required certificates, licenses, and registrations in order to hold this position. As delineated in the official position description, this position must have a high school degree or a GED, high school diploma or GED, three years law enforcement experience, must have a valid driver's license, must have a Nevada Post uh, certification for as a sworn officer, and must have a DARE officer certification. The current salary range for the position is, um, as advertised, is 43, approximately 43000 to 65000 Currently, the average deputy wage is approximately 60000 with an average hourly rate of $29. Fiscal impact for 21 is positive salary savings as the position has been vacant since June 4th and it will be assigned by uh, current staff and backfill is expected to be through normal entry-level non-post practices. And incidentally, I would uh, I'll suggest to you, we currently, as a result of many of the things going on in the world, it takes us about 12 to 18 months to get officers post-certified. Uh, any officer who is not post-certified within the 12-month period requires a waiver from the post commission. I'll be going down uh, to visit them in a few months and request a waiver on three of our officers. Uh, Ms. Davis was budgeted for fiscal 21 at $97,000 and fiscal 22, 99,000. Can I interrupt you for a second? You certainly may. Um, 
Um, you outrank me. The, <laughs> um, your statement on so so my under I mean I don't I don't know that it's necessarily germane to this but um, are you saying you're hiring non post certified deputies and like doing an internal training program? No. Okay. I guess I misunderstood that. To clarify, many of the employees that we hire are non post. In other words, they don't have any certification in the state right. of Nevada. Uh, that certification process is required to be done by law within twelve months. Uh, if not completed within that 12-month period, we have to uh, apply for a waiver from... Right, I got that part. Right. So my question was, are you hiring deputies who don't have post-certification then? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's you find that's beneficial versus hiring post-certified deputies? Are, the, are programs not available around the area anymore? Or? Likewise, we hire many post-certified okay. deputies. So it could be either way. In to this topic, um, in in my plan, we would re, re, we would hire on at a uh, non post. Right. That way, we could stay within those projected salary or projected uh, budget items and line items. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, the uh, previous position held. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to try and jump back to where I was. <laughs> Um, for fiscal 21 was approximately $97,000 budgeted. Uh, entry anticipated employee is approximately $86,000 for fiscal year 21. Uh, for comparative purposes, a currently qualified deputy at step four is approximately $106,000. Uh, I do have one uh, person within the department who is... Um, who maintains some of those certifications, but not all in order to complete the task. The options that we considered was to uh, remain as is, which conflicts with the bargaining unit descriptions as CCEA is predominantly a civilian based uh, organization. Um, option two was to move the position to the sheriff's executive charter uh, authorizations. Uh, however, I, I, I don't see this as an executive level position, and therefore that was not, not a good option. The third option was to move, uh, move this position by reclassification to the CCSDA, which is the Carson City Sheriff's uh, Deputies Association, consistent with the duty description as has been provided for many years. In conclusion, the worldwide COVID crisis has had a very detrimental effect on this agency's critical and hallmark uh, outreach efforts. Most of our programs are designed to enhance community contact, have been either canceled or suspended, prominently those programs that involve youth. We must begin to return our services back to a normal level as we, as we recover during this crisis down the road. Filling this position will allow that process to begin. It is my recommendation that this position be reclassified to deputy sheriff consistent with the training and functional assignments and with required certificates, licenses, and registrations. This action will correctly align the employee under the correct bargaining unit. This recommendation has been coordinated and concurred with by CCEA, uh, CCSDA, the Deputies uh, Association, and the superintendent of schools after consultation with the administrators of each of the individual schools. You have anything to add, Matt, or did the sheriff <laughs> cover it all? Um, I, I, I want to just give him a small segue um, because I know this, this is of interest to the board. Uh, COVID has really impacted our children and our schools, um, but as Matt will, can, can attest to you, uh, the activities of our uh, officers that are assigned to our schools and our youth in the programs has actually increased. Hello. So uh, as the sheriff pointed out, our activities have evolved a little bit. And Matt, could I have you identify? Oh, identify my apologies. For the record. Uh, my name is Matthew Smith. I'm a sergeant with the sheriff's office here in Carson City. Thank you. So to kind of allude to the evolution as to our program and the way that our SROs are now being utilized is we've actually experienced a little bit just in a couple of weeks that school has been back in session. And we all know that we're going back half days or some days not at all. 
So some of the things that we are doing now is actually being, the evolution is where we're going to start in, is where we're going actually down to more welfare checks, more checking on the children that are in need or some are even not showing up to school at all or not checking in. So we're actually assisting in our school board with that process, checking in. And we actually operate under a deferred kind of resource program. So our biggest goal is to actually reach out to those children and find ways that we can offer resources and ways to help them in recover or get more of a stable balance at home life as well. Uh, one of the programs we did yesterday is we, since school was on session is we all know that we do have some kids at home that may have not the best stable home life. So what we do is yesterday is one of those is we made a list, went out to different homes, checking in on their welfare, offering resources and offering services that we can offer or help them out in any way we can. Along with it, we brought along about 12 dozen donuts. Big hit with the kids and the families. <laughs> so it, yes. <laughs> but uh, that is one of the upticks we have seen is it'll starting to grow a little bit of a trend is doing more home visits now, checking in our kids, making sure that we can offer any kind of resources we can to make sure that they have a stable home life as well. Thank you, Matt. Yes, go ahead. So, um, Sergeant Smith, can you tell me, are the families receiving that well? The, the parents are okay with you coming so the to the house? and Absolutely. The reception we received and the multiple home visits we uh, go to is very positive, very well and good interactions with the parents. They love to see us out there, and they do take the advice and the resources we provide them, and it actually helps out tremendously. Oh, good. Happy to hear that. Thank you. John, Stacy, um, Sheriff or, or Sergeant, um, is there any integration between the behavioral health component, the most program, and what knowledge that you guys are given? Because it seems to me like a, a natural for you know for Becca and, and her team to to sort of give you pointers, if nothing else. Does it, does that? Did you guys work together on that? Yes, actually, we do. About two weeks ago, we did have a. <laughs> Uh, incident where we actually utilize that resource to come and assist us with a home visit. Uh, we had, I'm not going to give you too many details, but ended up being they assisted us greatly in providing this family and this student quite a bit of resources and also bringing in uh, DCFS to help us as well. So we had quite a few agencies, quite a few uh, resources available, and now that home life is more stable at home. So we utilize the, them as well. We also do take the training that our crisis intervention training as well. So that way we do have some least framework or starting points when we go to these different homes. And then when we get to a point where it may exceed our knowledge level or something of that nature, we do contact the resources and we keep going until we can able to provide as many resources as possible to these families. Added to that, um, very, very recently, by the way, this is Sheriff Furlong, um, this past year, this program has implemented a uh, initiative working with juvenile services to identify juveniles in need of assistance prior to them entering into the justice system, which is in response to uh, the outcry of, does my child have to commit a crime before somebody will help me? Right. Um, actually, with um, uh, juvenile services, Ms. Bannister and this program, we're able to now target kids and get them assistance prior to them entering into the juvenile justice system. Yeah, that's a great program. I'm involved with something similar through my employment with um, a program in Clark County where they're taking nonviolent first time juvenile offenders and not bringing them to juvenile hall, but bringing them to a community resource center where they do focused attention on improving their life. And it isn't just say, you know, call this person and get help. They really follow up on the truancy component and they follow up on the family getting the counseling that they're required to get. But um, to your point, Sheriff, it, it, the key is to keep them out of the system and get them the help they need so they don't ever enter the system because the statistics are once they enter the system, it's difficult to break that cycle and get them out of it. So. Kudos to you. And along those lines, I, I can't think of a more important way to spend money than on our kids. So um, especially at a time like this where there's so much going on, um, you know, that the face of this position um, is is the face of the sheriff's office in that youth community. So um, I'm, I'm in support of this. Thank you. Any questions, John? No. No? All right. 
there's no more questions, then uh, I would accept the motion. Okay. I move to approve the reclassification of the prevention program coordinator position for inclusion in the Carson City Deputy Sheriff's Association. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The vote is 4-0 to approve. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Matt. We're now on agenda item 15 for possible action, discussion and possible action regarding authorization for the Carson City Fire Department to apply for a grant in the amount of $1,802,033 through the Nevada Division of Forestry for money appropriated by Senate Bill SB 508 from the 2019 legislative session to fund hazardous fuels reduction projects in the Carson City Wildland Urban Interface Areas. Mr. Rubin, Mr. Slayman. Good morning, um, Mayor, members of the board. Uh, we are before you today with a proposal to apply for a grant through the National or Nevada Department of Forestry in the amount of $1,802,033. It is a no match grant, um, no required match from uh, the city itself. Um, Chief Rubin will go into greater detail. He's been the lead on this. Um, as a, as a point of personal preference, actually, I think I missed Sean Slayman, fire chief, um, for the record. Um, on another good news note, speaking of grants, yesterday we were notified that we received a safer grant award. Um, that is $3.6 million. Uh, we are working on the agenda report now and uh, with the goal of bringing it back to you on the October 1st meeting date. So uh, an exciting time for the department, a very busy time for the department. So. More details on that to come very, very shortly. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Rubin for this grant. For the record, Dave Rubin, Carson City Fire Department. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Supervisors, uh, we're here before you, like uh, the Fire Chief mentioned, a request authorization to apply for this grant through the Nevada Division of Forestry. <clears throat> uh, the, the last legislative session, the state legislature uh, approved uh, about $5 million for NDF through Senate Bill 508, and uh, they've partnered with Nevada uh, NV Energy. Um, this particular grant provides uh, funding for a three-year period to fund full-time five uh, firefighter positions um, and three vehicles. Um, at the end of the, the grant period, uh, the city would own the vehicles, and um, the work that the, the crews would do in this is primarily related to the uh, utility right-of-ways, the transmission and distribution lines. They would be doing work underneath those uh, right-of-ways, so if we have a power line that, that falls down or um, an issue on one of the cross arms on a pole, we wouldn't have a start in the, uh, the fire, excuse me, we wouldn't have a fire start in the vegetation below the lines or the poles. Um, in addition, uh, a benefit to the city, aside from having a grant that purchases capital, which is, is, is unheard of in this day and age, basically, and fund the positions, um, in addition to um, creating fuel, break, fuel breaks underneath those right-of-ways, um, because the grants through NDF, we're allowed to use that same equipment to do uh, fuel breaks around the community in other places unrelated to the NV Energy uh, infrastructure. So we can build on the work that we've been doing since the waterfall fire. Um, primarily that work's been mostly on the west side of town just because those are the grants that we've been able to get. But with this grant, we'll actually be able to expand the area that we're able to work in uh, to um, the east side of town as well. And that's actually one of the priority areas is the power lines coming in through um, to the Brunswick substation from Lyon County. So this gives us a lot more latitude to use the equipment um, we figure it's going to take um, through the billing, the, the grant kind of gives us an advance and then we bill back to the grant uh, against the advanced purchase price of the vehicles. So probably in about 14 months is our estimate. Uh, the vehicles would be paid off and, and then they're the cities. And through the period of the grant, um, I know some of you may have additional questions, the grant continues to pay for the maintenance of the vehicles even though once the city owns them, the, the grant will pay for the ongoing maintenance as well. And we're, we're optimistic that um, the, the current period of the grant's three years, but there's, there's a, a good likelihood that the grant period uh, would be extended. It's kind of like the Snippelman grant with additional rounds 
um, maybe two, uh, one or two more three-year uh, periods after this initial period. We'll, we'll see how that goes. This is a competitive grant? It, it is. Um, it's kind of a front-loaded thing. Um, NV Energy, it's cheaper for NV Energy to contract uh, with the fire agencies and they get a better product. They've, they've tried to go out and use private contractors to do some of this work. Um, that along with NV, NDF um, has to encumber those funds by the end of the year. So all those things uh, combined, it's competitive. We're competing with other fire agencies, but we've done a lot of work on the front end and pretty high confidence that we'll, we'll get this grant if we apply for it. The reason I ask, because it looks like we're asking for about 35 or 36% of the total grant for the state. So realistically, what do we expect? Do we expect that we'll get the full allocation or a partial allocation? From the folks I've talked to at NDF and NV Energy, we can expect to get the full allocation or pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. Good. Go ahead. So can you tell me as far as workload, while this is for a three-year grant and you're anticipating that you can, can maybe apply for more, how much work is there in Carson City that's needed? Is it a six-year project, eight-year? Can you, can you give me that, please? Well, uh, I'll, I'll say this. So there's a, a 110 miles of transmission and distribution lines and 2,413 power poles that need cleared underneath them. Um, in, in, in some areas, and I'll, I'll base this on our local area and, and some of the other fire agencies, we're a little bit um, at the end of, of the application. Some of the other fire departments are, are a little bit ahead of us in line for this um, and have been and doing the, the process already. Um, some days they can get three poles cleared because of where it is and access and it's billy goat country and some days they could get you know more cleared. Um, so I can't, I, I would say that we're not going to get all that work done in, in three years, pr pretty unlikely. Um, I, I couldn't tell you how long it's going to go. The, the other side to that piece is um, whenever we do any of the fuel reduction projects that we've done, th this included, there's a grow back time. So three to five years later, we're not quite back to square one, but vegetation grows back and has to be removed again. So it's kind of good news, bad news thing. Good news is we get the money to do the work. Bad news is we're never out of work because everything grows back. As part of this program, is there any pre-emergent used to so that it slows down that pre-growth period or regrowth period? There is. Um, it, NDF hasn't decided exactly what that's going to be yet. We're uh, pushing more towards a, um, a pellet type of pre-emergent, but there's also liquid sprays. Um, that's going to be up to NDF. But once the areas are treated underneath the utility infrastructure, there will be some type of pre-emergent um, put underneath there to, to, to minimize the, the grow back or slow it down. Any additional questions? Stacy? Just a, a you know, comment, probably not really a question. I think that uh, NV Energy has realized what has happened to PG&E in California and the devastating losses that they've suffered. And, and uh, that's why I share uh, Chief Rubin's um, belief that this, this will continue because $5 million is a lot of money, but it pales in comparison to the billions that PG&E is having to pay. And, and this is, uh, I, I actually applaud them um, Division of Forestry and the Fire Department for, for doing this proactively because we know that power lines start fires, you know, and uh, so I, I, this is a great program. It's a great program. Well, I, I think this is what you see when the owner of the utility company is an insurance guy. Exactly. Yeah, he knows how to mitigate risk. Uh, two other things. So the, the, the legislature um, uh, put the five million in, but NV Energy has also contributed another five. So there's there's about ten actually in there. And as I do apply to NV Energy, but also they were required by the Public Utility Commission to give the Nevada Public Utility Commission their props. Um, they did require MV Energy come up with a disaster plan, um, and and told MV Energy you have to you have to do something about this and and come up with a plan. So. But they are, they're being very proactive, and, and uh, I think this is a great opportunity for the city to get a lot of work done and get some capital, uh, which we can use on other projects down the road. Sorry. So can, can you talk to me about how the priorities are selected for the work to be accomplished with 
2,000 polls to do? How, how is it determined? Um, it, it, it's going to be determined in conjunction with NV Energy and NDF. Um, primarily, NV Energy will um, be the main driver of it. They, they know their infrastructure better than we do in what areas. Um, you know, that's not our expertise. So I know, like, as an example, for right now, their main areas that, that they've talked to us about that they want to prioritize is the lines coming in from Lyon County in Mount House over into Carson, um, the lines going up to Lake Tahoe, up the Voltaire Canyon, and uh, as well as some of the lines that are over uh, kind of by the Carson-Washoe line in South Washoe Valley uh, over in Lakeview. Those right now, I think, are going to be the initial areas that they're the most concerned about. Um, and so they'll, they'll kind of be uh, determined in that. And, and one other thing, too, just uh, for, for the public, um, we, we'd, um, if there's a fire and we need to have these guys on a fire, we can pull them off that project and, and use them on a fire as well. Um, so we have a lot of latitude of, of how, how they're used and what the end, uh, end result is. So there isn't any way, if I may. So there... There isn't any way for the public or anything to participate to say this is an area that I can see out my backyard in these poles and would you please pick this as a priority to come and do. I, ju I just want to clarify for the record that it's NDF and NV Energy that are setting the priorities and the not the day-to-day -day work schedule, but they're, they're classifying the poles or the areas to be worked not the Carson City Fire Department. Yeah, Dave Rubin, uh, Carson Fire for the record. Um, yeah, and it's not going to be a, uh, it's a very high level look at it and we're set in big project areas so um, we can stay in those areas and do the work so we're not really going to be able to bounce around to Supervisor Giomi's house, to your house, to Supervisor Barrett's house, to, to just as an example, um, or Mrs. And, Smith's and my house. my house just burns? Is that what you know, you're saying? <laughs> um, it, it, it's not, uh, it, it won't be at that level. It's going to be a very high, uh, what we call landscape level. We're doing very big, broad uh, project areas. And that's not to say that people can't reach out to you over fire concerns that they have. It just wouldn't apply to this program. Correct. Yeah, if somebody has a fire concern anytime, uh, we deal with those on a, on a regular basis. As you know, um, folks that, that whether they back to BLM or city property or whatever, um, we'll send somebody out to take a look at it. Right, those get taken care of through a nuisance ordinance? Um, in the wildland urban interface areas, normally we're the lead agency on those things. Uh, the weed-related weed issues that are in town are dealt with through uh, code enforcement, not us. Thank you. Thank you both. Any additional questions? All right, then uh, I got Stacey. It. I move to authorize CCFD to apply for the grant as presented. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The vote is 4-0 to approve. We're on agenda item 16A for possible action. Discussion and possible action regarding two proposed grant applications totaling $2,090,000 to the Nevada Division of Emergency Management for the design and construction of detention basins in the Gonai watershed. Mr. Stuckey. Uh, thank you. Dan Stuckey, Deputy Public Works Director for the record. So, um, yeah, thanks for reading that. These are two grant applications we'd like to submit under, it's the BRIC grant program, which stands for Building Resilient Infrastructure and in Communities. It's a new grant program through FEMA. Um, as you remember, we presented the North Carson area drainage plan back in March of 2019, and there was a, it was a good plan. We prioritized our top-rated projects with that plan and, and showed the board. That was strategic because we'd like to leverage local dollars to pursue some of these grant opportunities. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking the one and two top-ranked uh, projects off that list and submitting applications to try to, to try to leverage our dollars. This is a 75-25, so 75% federal funding, 25% local funding uh, grant opportunity. Um, the, the two applications, one would be for Maxwell Basin uh, Detention Basins, which is our number one priority project, and that's for design and construction, so it's about $2 million overall. And then the second grant application is to basically advance preliminary design, do some environmental clearance for the Sutro Basins. Um, that was our number two project. We believe with that second application, we could use um, 
to possibly pursue another grant opportunity in the future. So that'll strengthen. I think that is, is our approach there. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Dan, uh, were any of these basins uh, in the report, were they included in the storm drainage master plan CIP? Yes, they are. These basins are included in our, um, I'm not sure if they're in the five year plan, but they're definitely in our 20 year plan, um, of both projects. So if we end up getting grant funds to build the basins, then at that point, would we reevaluate the CIP plan? Uh, and do you suspect that may have a, uh, an impact on uh, long term rates? Um, I think depending on the outcome, yes, we would reevaluate the CIP program. I don't know if I, I can answer for, for rates. I think I'm not sure if Darren's on the line, but yeah, that and, would impact. Yeah, and I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but just thinking through this, if we end up getting, because I, I remember right, it was 20-some million total to build all the basins. If we were fortunate enough to be able to get grant money to fund the, a, a big portion of that, it seems just a logical thought that that's going to affect the total amount that the ratepayers would have to pay for long term. So anyway, that would most likely get taken care of in a, any evaluation or reevaluation. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any additional questions, Stacy? Yeah, ahead. just I just want to make two comments that you know the the um, ability for us to apply for this just to remind everybody is because we have a hazard mitigation plan um, that we continually update. This gives us the ability to apply for FEMA funds, and that um, our participation in the Carson Water Sub Conservancy District um, helped to fund the drainage study. So those two cooperations that the city is a part of, um, and and efforts that we have taken in the past have led us to be able to get, you know, this, you know, a significant amount of money, just to remind everybody. Any other questions? All right, then I would accept the motion. I move to approve submittal of the two grant applications. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The vote is 4-0 to approve. Uh, Lee, at this time, I think we're going to take uh, about a about a five minute recess, and then we'll be back. So back at uh, Tintel.
And I will reconvene the meeting of the Board of Supervisors. And we are now on agenda item 17A for possible action, discussion and possible action regarding shade struct. Nope. Is that right? Okay. All right. Uh, shade structure alternatives at the Brewery Arts Center, Third Street parking lot, and McFadden Plaza. Mr. Plemmel. Yep, I'll start. Lee Plemmel, Community Development Director. Um, this item is before you were bringing back information that was requested previously. I just want to give a little bit of background on this before turning it over to Dan Stuckey to talk about the shade structure alternatives. Um, just a little bit of history back in December, the project for funding to improve the Third Street parking lot to repave it, redesign it was before it went, went to the Citizen Redevelopment Authority Citizens Committee. Um, the discussion included possible shade structure. Their recommendation to the board was to, to fund the improvements to the parking lot, but without, without the shade structure. As that was brought to the Board of Supervisors on, uh, on uh, December 19th, um, we uh, so there was more discussion about looking at alternative locations and to, to consider not only the shade structure at that, but then to look at also other alternative locations for the shade, stru shade structure to include, and, there, and possibly the farmer's market to include the Brewery Arts Center. So there's that that's included in this, and then I think what was added on, not necessarily for the farmers market, which is, was the shade structure in McFadden Plaza. So that information is included today that Dan's going to go over. And the last thing I just want to note in terms of in terms of funding the project right now, uh, al funding has been allocated within redevelopment for the repaving for, for redoing the parking lot at Third Street, that funding's in place, um, excluding a shade structure. So any, any action today to give us direction to do a shade structure would have to come back for, for funding for the, for the shade structure. Um, with that, if, you know, the estimated that we know of for undesignated and redevelopment right now is approximately 113,000. Um, once, once the augmentations go through by the end of this year and there's roll forward from last year, I would expect that to go up, but, but, but until we know that number, I'm not sure exactly what that number is. But if you give us direction on any shade structures today, we would, again, we'd have to come back to authorize the expenditure because we, to, you know, today we don't know what your action is going to be. Um, but we could come back with an expenditure at least to start design, even if it's something where we need more money it might have to carry in after augmentations or it might have to carry into next year, but at least uh, we do have definitely have the funding to start design if that's an option for your consideration. But I want to turn it over now to Dan to go over the options and that you requested. Yeah, before, before you start. Ask a question? Uh, when you say bring it back, uh, you mean to the, to the RAC and then to the, the authority, the board? Or do you mean for for... Um, redevelopment authority money, or are you talking about here? I think um, I think you provide direction. I think the, the RAC has made a recommendation that they don't think the Third Street parking lot is the spot for a shade structure for events. I think they've made a recommendation on that. If your if your direction is to pursue another location, um, I think it would be the appropriate to bring it back to the rack for a recommendation on the expenditure as we usually do you may even direct us to take it back to rack if it's the third if it's the third street parking lot but that would be up to you thank you thank you dan stuckey deputy public works director for the record so i, I was just going to kind of walk through you have um you should have had all the conceptual designs with your packet i was just going to walk through those so we can go back and forth um, you know the three locations, as Lee mentioned. I did want to talk about just some considerations that staff made throughout this project. There are, in your packet, you'll see the different types of shade structures that were considered. I've listed them there. Basically, there's a solid um, metal type structures that you would see. And then there was also some fabric canopy type um, shade structures as well. I do want to point out that fabric canopy, we didn't consider that in any areas that would be um, 
that are owned or maintained by city forces. And that's, um, so that would be the, the McFadden Plaza as well as the Third Street parking lot. And that's just because based on past experience, there's, there's a liability with, with shade type sales. You have to constantly monitor high winds. You take them down in the winter because they don't handle snow loads. Um, so those types of things. So we did not consider those for city owned property. I did want to point that out. Um, stakeholder coordination, as you mentioned, we've met multiple times with the Brianna Coons at the farmer's market, as well as Gina Lopez with Brewery Arts Center and considering how the farmer's market set up. This is for, I'm talking about third street parking lot as well, the Brewery Arts Center, how the farmer's market would work with these conceptual options here, as well as coordination with, with the Brewery Arts Center. So I did want to point that out. I know they're aware that this is coming today. I think they're on, on the call if you have questions for them, um, as well. Uh, Lee mentioned the Third Street parking lot. There's four hundred thirty thousand dollars in the budget, and I just listed the things that that in, that include, and as uh, that that the budget does include. As Lee mentioned, it does not include currently a shade structure. And then I just wanted to point out. I mean, there a part of the Third Street parking lot. Um, we are there's some some large trees that have been around for a long time that we're proposing to to remove as part of that project. We did hire an arborist to assess those uh, many months ago, and it was recommended just looking at condition of the tree, um, remaining useful life that they, they estimate, and just damage to the surrounding infrastructure is recommended to remove that. Um, but I did want to point out that you know, there is some tree removals with that project, but we've also made a significant investment in the downtown corridor with planting of trees. They're going to take some time to grow that shade canopy. But I did point out that there is 150 trees that we plan with Carson Curry. So I think it's important to know for the public that, that we have made that investment. Um, just options, I'll run through them. You've seen them. Uh, this is concept one for brewery art centers. There's two options there. This is about $98,000. And this is that shade sale, the, the, fa the fabric uh, type canopy layout there. And again, this the, the layout there was worked through with the, BA, the brewery art center with our design consultant. Moving on, very similar uh, location, but this is um, a, more of a, a permanent type metal um, structure there. And of course, the, the cost is higher as well. So 152,000 is, is what's considered with that option too. Um, third Street parking lot. So this is a trellis type metal structure and you can see some pictures there, some um, renderings um, and it's kind of located in that central part of the parking lot. I think the, the, as far as the farmer's market there and as, you, as far as their operations during the farmer's market days, both here at the Third Street parking lot and um, if, if the Brewery Arts Center, they were to move there, although there is a letter with your packet from Brianna Coons at the farmer's market, um, but they would set up their vendors underneath these, these shade structures there. There would be power on this one run out to that, so the vendors would have opportunities to plug into power um, at the shade structure. Um, McFadden Plaza, we consider two concepts. Again, the shade, the canopy fabric was not considered, but we did look at two metal trellis types. They're very, I mean, it's the same type, but it, one we considered half part of the, if you, the eastern edge is a little bit more, there's not as much area there. So we wanted to look at an option of keeping that eastern half open. And then the western half where you have, you know, the, the splash pad in a little more open area, maybe putting something there. So that's this option for $55,600 estimate. And then the last option is basically taking that the full span of the plaza um, for about 87,000 there. So those are the three options, or five options, I guess, at three different locations. Happy to answer questions. Daisy? Um, I, just on those trellises, um, can they be oriented so that the, to maximize shade? I mean, I, I know it doesn't look like this, but can they? I mean, obviously, the sun direction is generally south and west. and So can the, the individual louvers be oriented to, to maximize the amount of shade that it'll provide? I believe so. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that can be incorporated and would be. Well, let me follow up on that. I, the picture doesn't show what you're saying is that the slats would move. Yeah, in the, the structure footprint would stay the same. I think you're just talking about the slats would yeah. be oriented a different yeah, direction. Yeah, to, to and make be able more to shade. Tell. Yep. That, I mean, that's not shade. Where it shows, I mean. Yeah, but I think they could be. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to, thank you. Do you have any more questions, Stacey? No. No? 
Lori? Yeah, I guess I'll just comment there. Um, so the RAC recommended no on 3rd Street, right? They recommended no coming from that. Looking at McFadden Plaza then, um, so I kind of was standing there uh, recently. I had a small event there. Um, and, and the trees are really starting to grow. You just don't want to say how old you are. I, I'm, I wasn't saying how old you were either, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was leaving you out of the discussion, too. It was a high school too. reunion event, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we did graduate together. But anyway, I was trying to leave us both off that. Um, I'm just seeing that the trees are really starting to develop, and maybe that's part of the issue that the Third Street is concerned about, is they're so used to the tree canopy that they have. But if we have the 150 trees planted, I recognize it may take a little bit of time to get back to a shade scenario. But I also um, looked around at a lot of um, farmers' markets in some of the other locations, and, and they do not have fixed shade structures. They're all using their tents that they have to do, that they put up, you know, to be their own booth. So it, it just doesn't seem to be working for me to um, expense this money. And so I just want to kind of put that out there. I think the trees may take us a little while to get to where we want to go, but, but that will be the beauty of the downtown with the trees. Yeah, my thoughts were similar on, on the 3rd Street parking lot. Um, I'm having a real difficult time, um, you, you know, trying to figure out how this is a good investment because it's a parking lot. It's not a venue for meetings, even though we use it that way for the farmer's market and it's worked out pretty well. Um, but I think that there has to be other ways to accommodate shade and if that's planting new trees and, and it taking a few years for them to provide some canopy, I think that that would be a better way so that we maximize that site as parking. Uh, I think that the shade structures impact the, uh, the entire site too much. Uh, on McFadden Plaza, um, the half structure there, um, you know, I could probably be talked into that, the full length, probably not. Uh, and then on the Brewery Arts Center site, you know, the more I thought about that, I realized that I was the one that kind of brought that up and, and pushed it. Um, but the more I think about it, the more I think that if there is a private venture between the BAC and the farmer's market and or the city between those three entities, then that needs to be worked out separately. So at this time, I don't know that I'm in support of any of the street shade structures. So, um, I uh, on the BAC, I agree. I think that if we did some cooperative effort in the future, we'd have to revisit it. But um, for now, um, you know, the BAC can use this and try to do some fundraising. They've got now kind of an idea, and and at least from that extent, they they have the ability to do it. And um, I was originally in support of the parking lot shade structure. Um, but again, spending $100,000 on something get, that gets used um, one day a week for six or eight months of the year, um, you know, and, and we're not turning that into an event center. So um, I would agree with that. Um, McFadden Plaza, um, I, I would actually like to see either the half or the full shade structure here. I think we have the funds to do it. It's a centerpiece of downtown. Um, it adds a component that I think will draw people um, in the summer, especially with a splash pad there. Um, so I would, that's where I would go if I made a motion. John? Thank you. Um, first, I want to say that uh, I agree mostly with what Stacy said. If we did it anywhere, I think McSadden Plaza makes the sense. Um, but I have to say, as the representative from this board who serves on RAC, I was really uh, disappointed, although I'm told by the engineers my disappointment doesn't matter, uh, that we were even taking these trees at 3rd Street down, and but the parking lot has to be redone. 
I just, I just, it seems to me like a tragedy for our downtown. But if it has to be done, it has to be done. Uh, so uh, I would agree with Stacy that probably the best way to go would be only McFadden Plaza. Um, I, I don't, I, I think all everyone's comments here regarding the BAC and the Third Street are accurate, but it's just. Uh, a sad thing for me to see those trees go on Third Street. I think it's a beautiful part of downtown. Nevertheless, yeah. things age, even me. I was going to say, relative to that, we haven't looked at it again, right? I mean, I asked you in an email, Dan, but the, your response to me was relative to the first time an arborist looked at it. And I mean, it's, it wasn't it wasn't one of those things that was teetering on the edge of, gosh, we could save them or no, we probably should. I mean, it was definitely, they have to come down. Right. I just wanted to confirm that because I'm, I'm in the same camp as uh, John and I think all of us, you know, you just, you know, we live in Nevada, you don't cut down trees. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, it was not reanalyzed again since the, the first uh, time we sent the arborist out, but the, the report, I would say, was not teetering. I mean, there was a number. I mean, obviously, if we want to reconstruct the parking lot, leaving those trees there, the the root struck i mean we basically have a damaged parking lot again and i think when they looked at the condition and again that life expectancy that they expect out of those trees it just wasn't wasn't there so i would say it was a pretty pretty uh conclusive report yeah i would say too that our experience at mills park and at fuji park that you have to be very careful when the cottonwoods get to a certain age because um you know as we saw at the state fair a couple of years back you know we had a tree branch from one of those cottonwoods that was, I don't know, 12 or 18 inches in diameter that fell on one of the vendor stations. And fortunately that happened at night when nobody was there. But what we really don't need is for that to happen during the farmer's market. So if they are to that point, then unfortunately, um, I think we have to move forward with that. Um, so I think that the direction has been that the BAC and parking, third street parking lot sites are are out, that there's really no appetite for shade structures at either one of those events. Um, and I think what I'm hearing is that there may be some interest in a shade structure at McFadden Plaza, um, but I don't know that I got a definite direction on whether that's the half plaza structure or the full plaza structure. Well, uh, We should send it back to RAC. If you'd like, or... Um, I think that we can get away with direction on this because okay. the motion was for a resolution. Yeah. So if you want to try something, go ahead. Well, I was just going to suggest that uh, I move to direct staff to um, present uh, the options to RAC for uh, funding either the half or full McFadden Plaza shade structure uh, and return to the board Second. for the results. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The vote is 4-0 to direct staff to go back to RAC with options on the McFadden Plaza shade structure. One, one more question, if I may. Do we, do we have to do anything for the expenditure of the funds to continue the parking lot? Or were, you said they were committed, so we're good to go, right? So that you can process and... Start working on that. And one more question. Uh, ahead, how, how high are these the shade structures you showed us on the plaza? Um, I'm not exactly, I, I should know that, and I'm not sure, but I think that can be adjusted. That's not a huge, uh, you know, a huge cost that would break the budget. But I mean, an, I mean, I would say 12 feet at least probably on the height. Thank you. All right. All right, then we'll move on to item 17B for possible action, discussion and possible action regarding long-term stay motels and direction to staff regarding possible amendments to the transient lodging tax provisions of Carson City Municipal Code, Chapter 4.08, and the transient occupancy requirements for hotels and motels in CCMC Title 18. Lee. Thank you. Lee Plemel again for the record. Um, this is, an, uh, this is another item we've had discussion on in, in the past. I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, long-term stay motel um, inspection program we've, we've had over the last couple of years that's been kind of on hold recently because of COVID and 
proximity restrictions going through that, so we haven't been doing that. But we've had discussions. We've had at a couple of uh, supervisors' retreats and and planning sessions discussion about this. And in fact, at the I think it was at the last strategic planning session that we were directed, staff was directed to come back with more information on really what what is the scope of long-term stay motels rel relative to our motel and hotel room inventory in Carson City. So in working with the um, Culture and Tourism Authority, um, Dave Peterson's on the line and available for questions, working with them, you'll see a report in there which just is the is the last December report, which includes December and the, the, the whole year of 2019 on transient lodging tax revenues, just to get an idea of what, uh, what they collect in transient occupancy tax revenues. Um, and, you know, their kind of estimate on how, on what, what, uh, how many long-term stay motel rooms, and then also attached, you'll see that uh, we have an inventory based on, based on business licenses and and the uh, number of rooms that each property has. So, based on business licenses, we have 1,876 rooms, motel and hotel rooms in Carson City, and. So how you estimate how many are long term at any given time it fluctuates um, but you know as 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 I put in there just picking out the properties that we know offer the all of the rooms for long term stay that's 621 rooms or 33% of the total that are at least offered and available on a regular basis for for long term stay now some of those properties certainly were rent short term and so they're not always used long term and and almost certainly some of the other properties that are generally not long term probably occasionally have some some that are long term um, but I think the, the purpose of this item was to bring the bring the information back to you to have some more discussion on this um, it, it, in case there's anything that the board wishes to do regarding the transient lodging tax, there's a, which for which there's an exemption in, in code, in Carson City Municipal Code, that if you pay for 28 days or more, then you don't pay the transient lodging, lodging tax, which is what a lot of the properties do. I'll just take this real quick, too, to kind of, I know the questions come up about why are some motels allowed to rent long term, and... Um, it's because the, the city's limitation on the transient occupancy limiting stays to 28 days or less for motel and hotels came into effect, I, I did the research before, but sometime in the mid-90s. So, and, and then there's provision in code that says if you're in existence and doing a, a business operation, when an ordinance is adopted, you get to follow the old rules. So the old rules that a lot of our hotels, which most of which were built before the mid 19th, they're allowed to follow the old rules, which doesn't restrict the, the short term stay. So if the board wanted to change that, that's not to say that that has to be that that's what our current code says for that use. But in terms of grandfathered uses, you could adopt an ordinance that eliminates that that grandfathering for a specific type of use. So that's not saying that you want to do that, but in terms of just putting the options out there of the things that are on the table that, that you could do, that's that's one of them. So I think you, you have the report there. Uh, David Peterson and Chris from the Culture Tourism Authority are on the line to answer any questions you have on that. And so I'll, I'll leave the presentation on that. I'm sure you have some questions. So I received quite a bit of comment on this particular item and the comments focused generally in two areas. First. Uh, on RV parks, um, got quite a bit of comment on RV parks and um, the general consensus was that it would harm uh, tourism if we implement an 11% tax on RV stays. And then the second group of comments were on the low to moderate income uh, demographic uh, or even homeless demographic and they're, um, they make up a large part of the population that are staying in these transient long-term stay rooms. And what happens to them when they're barely getting by and just living off of Social Security? And would that push 
those residents out onto the street. So that was the general consensus of, of all the comments that I got. So I'll open this up now for questions. We'll start with Stacy. Yeah, I, I had similar comments and um, I, I have similar feelings. At the same time, I, like you, am familiar with um, what some of the inside of these complexes look like. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that eliminating this is will fix that, um, especially considering where the funds will go. Um, and I and I don't think that we have the ability to change where the funds will go because it's set in state law. But I, I would like to ask Lee on the grandfathering part because if 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 we carry the theory out that an eleven percent increase will force people out of all of these <laughs> potentially at one time, um, and and I could see that happening. Maybe not everyone, but a high percentage, but if, if as, as ownership changes, could could it be tied to ownership? So in other words, if if the if property changed ownership, could they be uh, grandfathered out, so to speak? And at least then, maybe we'd have an opportunity to, on a case by case basis, ha start to have these improve and and turn into something better than they are now. So I guess that's a question. Yeah, I think I think well, we would certainly want to consult with the district attorney's office on that, on the legality of how that would work. Um, but I would suggest it's not necessarily that wouldn't necessarily be effective uh, because change of ownership. So so as as many recently, some of these motels have actually changed ownership. The assessed ownerships were, had the assessed ownership of an LLC has remained the same and not changed, but that LLC has been sold multiple times for some of these. So it might not be uh, so it might me, not even be a solution because they'll get around that because the motel owner will just sell the LLC that owns that motel, oh, and I the ownership has not changed, even though it really had. It really has. So they'll sell the LLC that owns the, the property. Sell, but and the, LLC, but the same LLC continues to own right. the, the property. But it's, it's, it's a possible, it's a possible well, way. Yeah. We'd have to look and do further. I, I mean, I guess the, the other side to it is, because really what, what we're talking about is having livable conditions for people. I think that's what we've always been. I mean, that, that was my goal when I was in the fire department. And, and I, you know, so I, I guess... You know, do you feel like the city can make? I mean, I know the answer to this, but I but I, I need to know if you feel like we can enforce it. I, I mean, I feel like the rules are on the books to force them to comply, absent this changing LLC thing, which is like a dog chasing its tail. I mean, we're never going to catch it. Um, but by the same token, I don't know that we've been as hard as we can be. Um, in terms of even shutting a place down if it reaches a level of unsafety that that it is flat out unsafe. Um, so I, I honestly think we've been probably nicer than we need to be. Um, and if we really are serious about cleaning this up, then I think we can be stricter on the rules and not mess with the 11%. So and I'd I like would, to hear what you think about yes, that. Yes, and I, 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 w I would agree with that. I think we are... I think we were getting to the point where we're being strict. I think we have, through the program that you know that we've talked and you've authorized, made improvements. I think you can see improvements to some of the properties. I, I think it's really unfortunate right now that we can't continue to go out into all the rooms. Um, but I think the program was working. I think we put pressure on, I think the, the program caused pressure on some property owners to sell and get out. And get some fixed up. So I think, I think if if I was making a recommendation, I mean, I th I think that's at at least what we want to continue doing, and to continue with the affirmation that, in strictly enforcing the the building code and fire code laws, and getting as many inspections as possible is the way to go forward. I would um, say that you know I I originally brought this item years ago to do exactly what Stacy just discussed, which is we want to improve the living conditions 
for the people that are that are there and and I think that that's our job we cannot I don't think we should allow unsafe conditions in these motels but one of the things we're in the process of you know rewriting our codes and things and so maybe I would ask that we look at where are we too lax in the code? Because the one problem that I had with all the inspections is it takes a long time to effectuate the change. And so if there's something that we could actually do in our code to give them the right to correct, I mean, I want to do that to say, OK, we've noticed you've got this error, and you get so many days to correct. What I'd like to do, though, is see if there's anything we can do to speed up once we've identified a, um, an issue at a particular location so that it doesn't take two years to accomplish the remediation. So I would say that I'm not interested in doing the removal on the tax, um, but the way that you would maybe not have to worry about ownership or anything else because it wouldn't matter who owned it, you can condemn a room, which takes that room out of their, maybe, right? Takes the room out of their uh, getting money at all, which would incentivize them to more quick, oh, I got to bring that room back, back into the rent uh, thing. So I would suggest that we look at any opportunity we can within our own codes to strengthen our ability to improve those living conditions. So can I? Can Thank I? you. I, I agree with what Stacy and Lori said, but I John, hold up just a second. Let me Lee <laughs> answer Lori, and then we'll go to your question. Thanks. I'll, I'll th sorry, Supervisor Barrett. I'll, f I'll forget the question if it gets too hard. <laughs> the, uh, so regarding, I, I think right now we're updating Title 18 development standards. We have building codes. I don't think those codes are too lax. Um, they're there, you know, I think as Supervisor Giomi said, if we enforce those codes, um, we, we, could, we could get significant improvements. I think we're, you know, a couple things you're talking about is just our resources to, number one, to be able to get enough people to go and get through the process. And then secondly, it's that enforcement process, which is not Title 18, but other, other parts of the code that I know that, that in talking with Dan on other things, you know, definitely needs to be cleaned up as we move forward with Title 18 and the process is clarified and, and those things. So as uh, point, t point taken on that and, and we will continue to work towards that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to agree with Stacy and, and Lori about go a step or two further. Uh, I'm probably the person up here who has rammed around this country as much as anybody, if not more. And I took the tack when I moved to Indianapolis, Lincoln, and Carson City of staying in places like these. And for long term, while well, I look for permanent housing in each case. And this is a national problem. It's not just a problem here. And in bigger cities, it's even a larger problem. We are too lax, code-wise we may not be, I don't know, I haven't read everything that, that goes with this, but I've read a lot of it, and we are, in my opinion, too lax on enforcement. Maybe that's because we don't have enough people, I don't know what the reason is. I'm generally speaking a private sector guy. You could put me up against the wall and shoot me before I try to curb the private sector, but in this case, some of these people who own these things are taking great advantage of human beings who live in their facilities. It needs to stop, so I urge that we look very carefully at how to do that, including Lori's suggestion that we find a way to speed it up if possible. I don't want to step on anybody's civil liberties, but nevertheless, other people who are in the private sector are stepping on their tenants civil liberties yeah I, I think i'm in agreement with everybody else up here i think the focus needs to be on improving living conditions although additional dollars to the cta is a great goal i don't think that that should be our primary consideration here 
and, and I'm just wondering if there's a potential for a for a uh, incentive program here, either through CTA or redevelopment or some combination thereof, that would um, be able to put forward some funds, some grant funds potentially for uh, new ownership groups that come in and then fix up these properties. Um, just a thought to throw out there. Uh, Brad, can I ask along those lines? Are, um, what do you know? What percentage of these are in a redevelopment area? You don't don't tell me now because I know you don't know right now. But can you maybe just give that to us? Because that that I like that idea, and it would just be good to know what. Because I think just looking at them, I think a good number of them are. Right. Are. Or, like all yeah. of them within, you know, let's say south of John Street through the through the downtown corridor and all the way south down Carson Street are in redevelopment districts and would be eligible now for up to twenty five thousand dollars in facade improvement money to do exterior right. facade improvements. Okay, right. Yes. My focus would be to create a program Interior. in addition to the facade to clean up the inside of the rooms, and then we'd have to craft an agreement that. Um, that mandated that the rooms be maintained and that we have the right to inspect them for a certain period of time or they would lose the grant funding. So, I mean, these are just thoughts that we can discuss uh, going forward. So it sounds like, um, I don't know, have we given you enough direction, Lee? This, this item doesn't require a motion, so. Yes, thank you. Um, and then on the phone, uh, if there's a, any additional comments from anybody on the phone. I see no one on the line. Okay. Or, or, or through WebEx. Uh, David Peterson with uh, CTA, do you have any anything to add? No. All right. Nothing on that one. Okay. Thank you, David. All right, uh, then if you have enough direction, Lee, then uh, we will move on to item 17C for possible action, discussion of possible action regarding a proposed emergency ordinance establishing provisions extending the period of use of a storage container or metal storage container under certain circumstances. Pursuant to Article 2 of the Carson City Charter, this ordinance must be adopted by a unanimous vote of the Board of Supervisors since it is an emergency declaration. Lee. Thank, thank you. I, I would say this, this ordinance isn't a quote-unquote emergency, but it is being adopted under emergency provisions. So that's what, meaning that uh, time, the time frame is, is short and we, we need to get it adopted soon to, uh, to amend the requirements regarding storage containers. So as, you, as I've previously been before you, we've adopted a policy requiring um, or allowing outdoor uses um, dining and retail uses and in conjunction and probably more importantly we have the state governor uh, directives that are requiring you know limiting capacity in restaurants in particular and other types of businesses so that uh, tables and things are needing to be cleared out to make more room within them and this has led to the need for the use of temporary storage containers for those items that are needing to be removed from the interior of buildings this or um, presently, we can administratively allow this for up to 90 days. We anticipate that some businesses are going to need them for 90 days, and we're proposing that we allow them for more 90 days, more than 90 days during the emergency. Administratively, alternatively, as the code's written, many of these businesses would then have to get a special use permit, which is a fee and application, uh, planning commission item, and and we just. Don't think that's necessary. I mean, just during this emergency, and we uh, recommend adopting this ordinance that allows us to authorize them administratively during this period and subject to all the other existing uh, storage container standards that are already in the code. Questions? Yes. John? Thank you. Um, reading this ordinance, it says a storage container or metal storage container that is approved for an extended use in accordance with this section must be removed not later than 90 days after the date on which the extended use expires. Uh, if I understand this, that extended use would expire uh, when the governor uh, lifts his 
um, emergency. Is that correct? That's the intent, correct. So you want to give them another 90 days? Why not 45 days? It just so, doesn't make a lot of sense to be 90 days, seems to me. The 90 days was only uh, recommended because that's the current amount of time that they can have it administratively under the current, you, current laws. I understand that, but they're going to have it for maybe 212 right. days. I'm just making that up. So another 90 days? It doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Just bringing that out. Any other comments or questions? Um, go ahead, Lori. I think uh, John brings up a good point of, of how long is a reasonable time for them. And that's the real question, right? What's, what's the reasonable time once they get the drop dead date that, okay, the extended use is over, how long would it take them? I'm going to bet most of the ones that are having to use it because they had to reduce their restaurant size by 50% capacity. I don't think it's going to take them very long because they're going to want to go back to 100% capacity. So I think it'll have a natural uh, removal of those storage sheds anyway. But do we want to allow 90 days? Does it, does it take that long? I, I just am not in that business to know. I, you know, I, I think we're overthinking this. The, the, you know, the code, current code gives them 90 days. Uh, is it really that big a deal to give them 90 days? Uh, you know, we, we, none of us are in the restaurant business um, anymore. Anymore. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't know that we know how difficult things are going to be when the emergency actually ends and how quick people are going to be able to get it back in. Uh, it's already in the code. It just seems like a simple number to me. Well, and I think if you take it beyond restaurants, um, there are department stores or furniture stores or other types of retail stores that had to move out a lot of their inventory. And so now that inventory is in storage. When the emergency declaration ends, they not only need to remove whatever barriers they have in their retail brick-and-mortar location, then reconfigure, maybe bring in storage shelves or other uh, reconfiguration of their retail space and then bring that inventory in and they may not be able to bring all that inventory in immediately they may have to phase bringing that inventory back in um, so for that reason I, I don't know that it's the end of the world whether it's 30 days 45 days or 90 days um, you know so I guess I would rather err on the side of caution uh, if they're out there on commercial locations for as John said 212 days then do we care if they're out there for another 30 days or 90 days. They're, they've already been there, so people have already seen them. So maybe we are overthinking it. So I would uh, just ask that whoever makes the motion on this just uh, make a proposal on the time after the declaration ends. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I didn't ask in advance, Lee, so you can look it up. Can, can you tell me how many current uh, of these storage container applications you've approved in the 90 day? How many do we have? How many of the 90 day ones do we have? Uh, so you're well, there's been uh, two, two so far. Well, the 90 days isn't a problem. Thanks um, for everyone pointing out I overthought it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I move to adopt. Uh, bill number 113, ordinance number 2020-12, a proposed emergency ordinance establishing provisions extending the period of use of a storage container or metal storage container under certain circumstances and as presented on the record. We have a motion and a second. Any final discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. All right, the motion passes 4-0. Thank you. We are now on item 18A, and on this item we have some disclosures to read, and then I will introduce the item. We'll start with Supervisor Giomi. NRS 281A.420 requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from voting when I have a disqualifying conflict. In my private commitment, I am employed by Nevada Health Centers, a nonprofit organization which applied and is recommended for CDBG funding under this agenda item. 
In my private commitment, I have a fiduciary duty and a substantial and continuing business relationship with my employer. Although the recommended funding amounts under this item are submitted by the application review work group without my involvement, this board may choose to accept, deny, or modify those recommendations based on the judgment of a reasonable person in my position uh, would be materially affected by this employee or employee relationship. I will not be voting on this matter. Thank you. Uh, I'm next. NRS 281A.420 requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from voting when I have a disqualifying conflict. The Boys and Girls Club has applied and is recommended for CDBG funding under this item. In the past, my domestic partner served on the club's board of directors, and I also assisted on some matters in an unofficial capacity. My domestic partner resigned from her seat on the board of directors, and neither she nor I have any further commitment in a private capacity to the Boys and Girls Club. I make this disclosure in the interest of full transparency, but I do not have a disqualifying disqualifying conflict, and I will be voting on this matter. Supervisor Barrett. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. NRS 281A.420 requires me to disclose a conflict of interest and abstain from participating when I have a disqualifying conflict. My wife works for the Governor's Office of Economic Development, which oversees the state-administered CDBG program. My wife exercises her employment duties with independence and without consultation with me and my independence of judgment concerning any recommendations I make on this board for the allocation of the CDBG amounts is not materially affected by my mar marital relationship. And although her employee oversees the CDBG program and she handles that, my wife has no influence or interest in how Carson City allocates its CDBG. BG funding. I make this disclosure in the interest of full transparency, but because the matter before me today is not affected by my relationship and is therefore not a disqualifying conflict, I will participate and vote on the matter. Thank you, John. So we're on agenda item 18A for possible action, discussion and possible action regarding an allocation of up to $283,213 of Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Funding for fiscal year 2021. Mariana. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Mariana Gavric, Grants Administrator for Carson City. This agenda item is to approve the CARES Act for Community Development Block Grant Programs Coronavirus Response Grant, referred to as CDBG CV, a new grant for all of us. Um, the CDBG CV funding for Carson City for fiscal year 2021 is recommended by the application and review work group and subject to approval from the Board of Supervisors and for the uh, fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development staff have provided CDBG CV funds for the prevention and response to the spread of coronavirus. The CDBG CV amount granted to Carson City for fiscal year 2021 is $283,213. A maximum of 10% of this funding is allowed for administration, which is 28322 Staff anticipate spending the total amount allowed for administrative costs. No other caps have been placed on the CDBG CV expenditures. Carson City placed advertisements for the funding opportunity and received four applications for public service programs for total request of $2,682. The total amount of applications for funding is less than the amount available for CDBG C CDBG CV. Staff formed a community-based application review work group known as ARWG to evaluate and rank the applications and to make funding recommendations based on both meeting the CDBG, CDBG national objectives and the community priorities. The ARWG conducted a phone meeting on August 7th, 2020 and recommendation, recommends full allotment or full allocation of funds to the applications that were received. So I'm gonna go over the applications that were received. Number one, the Boys and Curls Club of Western Nevada requested $79,826 to expand their daycare program to observe COVID-19 social distancing and sanitation measures. Number two, St. Vincent de Paul 
requested $20,080 to supply for supplies, cleaning supplies, sanitation supplies, and for individual sleeping bags to support the nights of, off the street warming shelter. Number three, let's see, the Nevada Health Center uh, requested $57,191 to convert the Sierra Nevada Health Center parking area into a COVID-19 screening and testing area. And this, lastly, the Spirit of Hope uh, requested $51,585 for a transportation van for safe client transportation to again observe COVID-19 restrictions. Staff is requesting the $2,008 2008, $682 be allocated to these public service projects for COVID-19 as recommended by the ARWG. The amount of $46,209 not funded in this round is being advertised alongside the regular CDBG 2021 cycle for a second round of distribution. If approved, staff will forward the final uh, approved recommendations to the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development for their consideration and allocation of the CDBG CV funds. So thank you for your consideration of this request. Questions? Go ahead, Lori. Good morning. Good morning. Um, was this additional funding, because I see it's got dash CV, um, did it have different requirements than the standard CDBG? And what is the grant period on this? The, the grant period is one year. and. The, rec um, the requirements were, are in your, um, I it. yeah, memorandum. They're at the back, and there are um, one, two, okay. three, four sections regarding the requirements. Some of the requirements are different. Uh, obviously, everything needs to be related to coronavirus prevention in terms of this funding. So my, my question comes from, I'm um, looking at the review group mm -hmm. that was assembled to do this, and I noticed that one of them was um, a member from Ron Wood Family Resource Center. Correct. Could they not have been eligible to apply? So I just, I just wonder why we would have someone that's eligible to apply sit on a review group. I did ask if she was going to apply, or Joyce uh, Buckingham, who's executive director, I did ask her if she was going to apply, and she said she was not going to apply. So we had that conversation. So she was not interested in applying for this funding. They had received, they have received other state funding. It's just a thought process, but sure. generally speaking, they do receive a lot of city grant funding. So I just, okay. Um, but I noticed too that it indicates you're going to put the forty six thousand two hundred nine that's remaining up into the next round. So I was looking at the specific grant period. So is that only going to give somebody? When when did the grant date start? This isn't a backwards one to March. No. To so according to Jean um, Barrett from um, the Office of Economic yeah, Development, yes. <laughs> Um, the grant period starts when the MOU is signed. So you have a year from the point that the MOU is signed to use the funding. So it doesn't back up. So for instance, hopefully these MOUs will be signed in the next week or so, and then that period will start a year from there. So they've got about a year to use it. So you're saying the grant of the 46209 will be one year from that MOU? That's what I understand. Wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's unusual. That's, that's good news. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions, Lori, because it points out that it was the review group on the local level that did this, and my spouse actually just gave technical ad, uh, advice on when it all started and ended. She did. So although the 40, I believe it was $46,209 will be advertised along the regular CDBG funding the parameters of the grant are separate, so we'll have to do separate awards. Yes. Okay. Everything's separate, correct. correct. So it'll be multiple awards from different pots of money, and that'll be made clear in the, in the grant uh, application advertising? Yeah, I won't be advertising them together. I'll just, well, I've already advertised, but 
basically it's two different advertisements just at the same time frame. Right. So we've already started advertising for CDBG, C, CDBG 2021, the regular CDBG, and I've started advertising for the 46,000 46, as well. So. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay. All right. Then I'll bring this back and uh, accept the motion. I move to approve the grant funding as recommended. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. So the vote is 301 to approve. Thank you all for that. Thank you. We're now on agenda item 19, Board of Supervisors. Non-action items, future agenda items, review of projects, internal communications, correspondence. NC. Stephanie. Stephanie has some to start. Sorry. Thank you for the record, Stephanie Hicks, Deputy City Manager. I just wanted to bring a quick update to the board about the Stewart Roundabout. Um, as you know, the South Carson Street project is on schedule. Staff has continued to work towards developing the fourth leg connection of the Stewart Roundabout. Um, it will take some time, and so we just wanted to give the board a little bit of an update. This summer, staff hired a consultant to conduct the land surveying, and prepare the legal description and exhibits. It also allowed us to advance some of the design and develop a more refined cost estimate. Um, we plan to, or staff plans to submit the easement application to the Forest Service early next year, but as part of their review and application process, we'll have a historic and cultural review, as well as an environmental review. So those will both take some time to get through. We don't anticipate that the project requirements will be met um, in order for the project to con be constructed any sooner than 2022. So we just wanted to advise you, it that continues through. The efforts are being made towards that. At the same time, the lands bill is still um, in process. It did, it did get uh, initiated by the uh, US Senate, but due to other things going on, there's been a little bit of a stall there as well. So we'll see which one brings us to fruition faster. That's my update. Thank you. Any questions for Stephanie? Go ahead. Um, on, on the roundabout where, and maybe I should ask this when uh, Dan was here, um, <clears throat> where are we on the design for the roundabout? Are we, are we formalizing that? Do we have a committee? Do we, I mean, I, I don't want us to miss an opportunity to do that right? Um, and I, I really want the board to be involved in making sure we are doing something that's meaningful and appropriate and substantial. Are you talking about the art component? I'm talking about the art component, okay. sorry. And I can I can speak to that as well. So we, um, we actually had an opportunity to apply for an NEA grant, um, which will help leverage some funds that we do have. Um, so that was with the assistance of Public Works and many others, including the Western Nevada College Foundation, we were able to very quickly get that application in to meet the deadline. Um, we have um, several months before we will get a response from them. But the intent was, kind of following that time frame um, for when we'd be notified about whether we, we won that award, we would create a committee. Um, we would issue an RFP or RFQ for artists so um, we could determine what the parameters of, of what we'd like that piece of artwork to look like would be and we'd include all of that in, in that um, proposal. And then we could solicit proposals and have a selection committee determine um, what they felt was the best proposal and certainly bring it to the board for approval as well. Okay. Uh, had similar question, but I, I might have just not heard in the clarification here. Were you saying that before we release the RFP, this board will look at it? We, we, can, certainly, we can certainly do that. For what the concepts. Sure. I think that's... That's, Absolutely. I think that's what we're after is yeah. that we understand. I don't want to see it go out for the mm -hmm. artists to bid without us understanding what the concepts are that we're releasing. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. John, any comments, John? Uh, no question on that. Are we moving on? Yeah, to Nancy, and then we'll come back okay. to the board reports. I was going to wait till the uh, COVID emergency item, but since we have a little bit of time, I did want to let you know, update on the COVID supplies for businesses. Um, 
the order form for the businesses should uh, will go live next week on our website. And um, we have had some difficulty in getting some of the supplies that that we've ordered. We have plenty of masks. The, the gloves should be in October 9th. And uh, hand sanitizer stands are coming in. Uh, they're supposed to be in tomorrow. And then um, the hand sanitizer itself uh, on September 25th. We still haven't been able to get a hold of any of this, like the Lysol sanitizing wipe. So we'll still work on that. So, um, so once we see what items are being requested, then we're going to go right ahead and start ordering more so that, you know, we don't have another lag time. So any questions for Nancy? No. Nope. All right. Then uh, future agenda items. Nancy. No. Okay. All right, then uh, board reports. We'll start with you, John. Okay, last night uh, at a distance, the airport authority met. Um, Steve Lewis is in process of selling his FBO out at the airport to uh, TCE LLC and some developers who have uh, interest in Reno, Florida, and Springfield, Illinois, my state of birth. Uh, we also are, are authorizing purchase of a vehicle for the airport. And uh, we're going to be doing appraisals on certain properties that we would like to get uh, leased or, or out uh, for economic development, sort of the way the NNDA does for their getting things prepared so that there's not a long time frame. That appraisal will last about six months, and then we have a um, contract uh, to uh, have them updated in the next six months if they're necessary, if it goes beyond that, because state law requires that. That's the airport authority last night. Lori? Um, I don't know if any of the rest of you are getting phone calls or anything on the speed limits at the school districts. Um, so I want to just let the public know that, yes, we adopted a speed limit policy. And so many of the schools are going Monday through Friday, 7 to 4. Um, if you have issues with that, please contact Lucia Maloney with the transportation um, part of Public Works. She's our transportation manager because she'll be keeping those public comments so that when we come back to review in a year, we can see if we made a good decision or not on the um, time frames and the notes. So. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've gotten quite a few calls on Eagle Valley uh, School. Yeah, mine was on King and Mountain, as you might guess. Um, the uh, Carson Water Subconservancy District met last night. I don't know if Brad has an update, but I was just going to share that uh, we've got a very talented, the CWSD is a very talented staff member who is using a drone to do some high-level mapping of structures and inventories along the river. Um, and he's producing some really good historical information, taking historical photos, overlaying current um, uh, current river uh, tract, and uh, mapping you know loss of land due to river erosion. Um, it's quite impressive work. And as I was thinking about that last night, I know that we have um, pictometry at the district at the uh, assessor's office. And um, I thought there might be some relationship there that we could tie those two together because pictometry does uh, or has the ability to do land measurements from their aerial photographing. So um, I'll try and put those two in touch. Um, and then I've just handed to board members, and I, I'll let staff see this, but what you're looking at, there's a picture here. Um, it is the new Kit Carson Trail markers. Um, these are being uh, crafted by prison industries. Uh, the one you see there is just, it's not placed. That was placed there for a photograph. But the medallion is a Datsulali basket. Um, those were the medallions that Public Works saved from the embedded in the concrete. And then um, they, uh, each site will have a number, as you see the number one. Um, and then the year at the bottom is the year that structure was erected. So uh, each one of, there's 40 some odd of these um, we hope to have them in place uh, with cooperation of Public Works 
um, we being the CTA, uh, by the end of December. Um, and so maybe next spring when things are a little more normal, we'll have uh, some sort of a kickoff, but we might do a ribbon cutting of some sort. But uh, very pleased with the way they turned out um, and um, excited to get them back uh, on the ground and get that Kit Carson Trail uh, back in operation finally. That's this one looks me. great. Stacy, is that that's the old blue line, right? The old blue line, correct. Just so that yeah, the public. Yeah. Yep. So the people yeah. who know it is the old blue line, and um, yeah, the Kit Carson Trail, and and we do have a lot of historic structures in town that um, this will give you an opportunity to walk around downtown with uh, you know pamphlet reading material and um, and get some information on each of those structures. So plus, it's a nice little walk. And, uh, and are they doing it on the application on an app also? Where um, you can, we haven't not developed that yet, not but yet. Um, I suspect that's something that we might be able to work on uh, geosync it. But I think that'll be down the road. Right. Just I'm just happy to get this Great. part done uh, and get it off the redevelopment uh, exactly. project list. Great. I think this would make it easier to then address the Green Line tour, which is on the east side of Carson Street. So, correct. Uh, if there's going to be a, a geo type tour. Uh, coming down the road at some point, then then maybe we can incorporate the the Green Line tour as well. Um, the only thing I would add to Stacy's comments on the Water Sub Conservancy is that they are working on a, a project um, for the aquatic trail that runs through Carson, uh, along with Muscle Powered and and other volunteer groups, and we're coordinating that I believe with uh, with our uh, Parks and Rec people. But that's something that, um, you know, if we're going to bring the volunteers and, and do a project there, I'd really like to see it done right, uh, which means that that's going to take funding. Um, so just a thought for everybody else on the board to be thinking about if that project gets kicked off anytime in the near future, that that could be a really attractive uh, tourist type event permanent event for, for Carson City, or at least in the spring before the water runs out. Um, any final staff comments or status reports? Nancy. Thank you. Supervisor Barrett reminded me of something with the airport authority. So as you uh, probably remember back in, I think it was May or June, we extended the cooperative agreement that the city has with the airport authority. And we had talked about at that time of doing a joint meeting with the airport authority and the board of supervisors. So we're looking at doing that uh, either the evening of November 19th or December 3rd. So um, I'll be asking each of you which, which one will work better for you. Those are uh, our regular Board of Supervisor meeting dates. And so at that meeting, um, that would be used just to discuss any changes that we might want to see in that cooperative agreement. It will expire in May of 2021. Thank you. All right, any final comments or reports? Yeah, Brad, I'd just like to thank you and the pastor this morning for your um, comments and prayer regarding our lost mayor, our, our former mayor, who's now deceased. That was very, very nice, with what you all, what you said in his prayer. All right. Thank you, John. All right, if there's no other comments or reports, then we will stand in recess until 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>